So, I had the pleasure of checking out the first Demons movie as part of the Leeds Horror Film Festival. And shortly afterwards, I knew that I had to check out the sequel as well. Unlike the original movie, which had very much a cheesy 80s heavy metal themed soundtrack, the sequel instead goes for a selection of British new wave bands such as The Smiths, The Cult, The Art of Noise, and the very appropriately named Dead Can Dance. I don't know about Panic on the Streets of London being on the soundtrack, considering that we're in Berlin for this film, but you could have put in It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To, and it would have fitted quite well. As evidenced by frustrated party girl Sally, who kicks off a right old stink when she realises that someone she doesn't particularly like is on his way to her birthday party. Oh blimey, it's just like the first film. It's been badly acted and even badly dubbed over. It's like a Godfrey Ho ninja movie. We will all be destroyed. <laughs> Unless we destroy them first. Well, anyway, the guy that Sally doesn't want coming to her birthday party is her ex-boyfriend. So this bloke in the glasses goes outside to meet him and to stop him from coming in, I suppose. And this guy literally spends the rest of the film stood there like a spare prick at a wedding. Hang on a minute, isn't that the Oh My God guy from Troll 2? Oh well, no it isn't, but that's what I'm going to call him throughout the rest of this video. Blimey, Troll 2? That's another one I'm going to have to cover in the Big Daddy D reviews at some point. Although his role in the rest of the film isn't up to much, the Oh My God guy, at least he's spared from what happens to the rest of the party guests. Anyway, despite the oh my god guy standing outside to prevent the ex-boyfriend from coming to the party, Sally still stomps off to her bedroom and locks herself in to watch a horror movie. Even though there's still a, a large number of other guests at the party. You know, a bit rude. I think she wonder how she's got that many friends to be honest with you. The film within the film that Sally and a bunch of other characters that live in the same apartment block end up watching looks an awful lot like the film that the cinema goers were watching in the first Demons movie. Here, we get a bunch of gormless twats poking around the remains of the city that the outbreak took place in during Demons 1. Hang on a minute, does that mean that Demons 1 was just a movie? Hmm. In fact, let's take a look at some of the other characters here. Apart from Sally and her birthday guests, we get this couple, George and Hannah, who are expecting a baby very soon. Uh, and you'll also find that, uh, as the film goes on, that Hannah is literally the only competent female character in the entire movie. There's also a little boy that's been left at home on his own whilst his parents have gone out for the evening. Quality parenting there. I'm alone. Yes, goodbye. There's this woman that spends the entire film talking to a dog. Yeah, really. And there's this bunch of pumped up spandex wearing meatheads working out in the fully equipped gym that I guess all apartment blocks had in Berlin during the 80s. And hang on a minute. I recognise that killer tash. Is that Tony the Pimp from Demons 1? Well, yes it is. And although he's now playing a completely different character, he's called Hank in this, he's still pretty much exactly the same character as Tony the Pimp. He's even still telling people to be quiet. So anyway, in the movie within the movie, these four dozy tossers actually find the corpse of a demon. Do they leave it alone? Do they bollocks? In fact, they decide to stand next to it and take photos of each other. But one of these daft buggers had accidentally cut themselves earlier on and ends up reviving the demon by dripping blood onto it from the scratch. The demon then comes back to life and kills everyone. But he's not done there, oh no. For some inexplicable reason, the demon then comes through Sally's television and attacks her as well. Not a bad special effect for 1986 either. I wonder if the makers of The Ring saw this. Shortly after this, it appears that Sally has finally been persuaded to return to the party. But, oh dear, Sally's looking a little bit unwell. Sally then goes apeshit and begins to attack her guests, biting and scratching them. Ooh, the nasty little bitch. 
By the way, anyone who becomes a demon seems to spend an awful lot of time staring directly at the camera as if to say, Look, we spent more money on the special effects this time, can you see? We then cut to a scene outside where we see that Sally's parents are in town to visit their daughter for her birthday and they're just hanging around the German market that must have been around whilst the film was being shot. It's almost as if the director said, Oh yeah, the German market's in town this week. Bring a couple of cameras and film as much as you can. I'm sure we could fit it into the film somewhere. However, we never see Sally's parents ever again. Nope. This is literally the first and last time we'll ever see him in this film, making the entire scene seem somewhat pointless. I thought that eventually, Sally's parents would show up to the apartment and end up getting added to the body count, or getting turned into demons as well. But nope, we never see them again. <laughs> Meanwhile, the oh my god guy is still stood outside waiting for Sally's ex-boyfriend to arrive. He's driving around the streets of Berlin along with three other punk rockers. Hey, it's just like Demons 1, isn't it? Well, not really. You see, the cokeheads in Demon 1 actually ended up in the cinema where they were turned into demons as well, so at least they served some sort of purpose. But these guys? They don't even get to the apartment. They spend the majority of the film just driving to the party, and they're going fast enough to get this punk rock chick worried, yet it's not until much later that they actually get there. Where were they driving from? Paris? Anyway, back to the party, and it looks like Sally has killed everyone. Bit of a social faux pas, is that? It's then revealed that demons have got blood with acid-like properties. Hmm, someone's been watching Aliens. And this bile begins to seep through the building, burning through the ceiling and into other apartments, and shorting out the electrical system. Not only that, but anyone who is unfortunate enough to come into contact with this nasty demon blood also becomes infected as the dog and the little boy end up transforming into demons as well. I had to laugh at this bloke though, who touches the bile and then casually tells his neighbour that it burnt his skin. Yeah, burnt his skin all the way down to the fucking bone, look at that! Downstairs, the apartment's fully equipped gym also has a tanning bed and a sauna. And after this bloke gets uh, demon blood dripped onto him whilst trying to relax, he goes apeshit bonkers and kills another gym user with the tanning bed. Mmm, smells like something's cooking. We then get our group of pumped up spandex wearing bodybuilders fighting off the demonic hordes using weights and other gym equipment before trying to escape. But just like in the first film, they're all trapped inside. Go on Tony, smash everything! He's not actually called Tony in this, but that's what I'm going to call him anyway. What's funny here is that our man Tony makes sure that he gets all the best weapons for himself, including a shotgun and an axe, whilst giving everyone else all the shitty weapons that's left over, like a potted plant or a fire extinguisher. What a legend. Bobby Rhodes, who plays the pimp in Demons 1 and the gym instructor in Demons 2, should now be considered as the stuff of legend here on the Big Daddy D reviews, and indeed at the Leeds Horror Film Festival as well, along with all the others like Peter Bark and Dudley Manlove. Yes, that's his name. Anyway, remember the little boy that I mentioned? When he doesn't answer the phone, his parents get worried and race back to the apartment. But guess who else is racing back as well? Yep, it's Sally's ex-boyfriend and his mates, and the two cars end up crashing into each other. But look at this shot, the camera's completely out of focus. At first I thought it was my DVD copy that was knackered, but then I watched the film again on YouTube and it was the same. You would have thought that the director would have said, CUT! And then just done another take of the film, but <laughs> apparently not. An ambulance then shows up instantly, as you do, and takes them all away, with the help of the oh my god guy. And these characters are never seen again in the film. So what was the point of having them in the film for about 10 fucking minutes then? I suspect that the finished film wasn't quite at a 90 minute running time, so they had to go back out and film some additional scenes which involved some pointless driving around the streets of Berlin, or the oh my god guy standing around, or Sally's parents in the German market. You could have cut out all of this and no one would have even noticed. You get the impression that Sally's ex-boyfriend and his mates would end up in the apartment and get killed by Sally. 
or the little boy's parents would get back to the apartment only to get killed by their own son, as they should do, leaving the poor bastard alone. Or that Sally's parents would get to the apartment and get killed by their daughter. But none of that stuff ever happens. As far as I can tell, Sally's parents spend the entire film at the German market stuffing their faces, whilst everyone else that was driving around in cars is taken to hospital along with the Oh My God guy. What a lucky escape for them then, eh? I suppose it's just as well for the boy's parents, because just look what happens to their kid. What the bloody hell is that? Looks like something from Gremlins. Or if not Gremlins, then something from that Gremlins knockoff, Ghoulies. Ah, and speaking of ghoulies, ooh, yeah, our man Tony gets grabbed by the happy sack. So that's him out of the picture. Ouch. So yeah, everyone that was left fighting off the demons in the garage get killed off. This poor little girl gets to see her mum getting blown away by Tony just before she can turn into a demon. Uh, and then her dad gets killed off and all whilst fighting off the demons, yet oddly enough he doesn't become one of them. There's some strange inconsistency where sometimes if you get scratched by a demon, you'll get turned into one. Uh, and sometimes you don't. It's like, okay. It looks like this little girl's in big trouble then. There's all the demons surround the car that her dad locked her in. But then all of a sudden, they just decide to run away? Um, what? Oh, remember George? He was just popping off down the shops to get his pregnant wife some cake. As you do. Only to get trapped in the lift with this hooker. George manages to escape from the lift. Although the hook has become a demon by this point, but George soon sorts her out. George, by the way, has now got his shirt all ripped with all his muscles showing off. So he's basically turned into Ash from the Evil Dead. Just like in the bloke in the previous Demons film. And hang on a minute, wasn't he called George as well? George sees all the demons running up the stairs, and so he sets a trap that manages to kill them all by starting the gas leak and then chucking a lighter at the demons. Despite the fact that this is the first time we've actually seen him with a lighter, and isn't it unlikely that he'd be smoking, considering that his wife's pregnant? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Hannah's managed to get shut of the gremlin ghouly demon thingy by pouring acid on it, which, you know, she just obviously happened to have lying around the house at the time, before George manages to finish off the little fucker with an umbrella. Anyway, you just know that George and Hannah are going to survive this movie, as the two of them have been able to handle themselves better than an entire group of bodybuilders were, despite being separated from each other and the fact that Hannah's nine months pregnant. Also miraculously, despite being right in the thick of things with all the zombie action, neither of our main couple have picked up a single scratch between them. <laughs> Fucking hell, that was lucky. Our surviving couple managed to escape the building and abseil themselves onto the roof of an adjacent building. Except, whoops, guess who's still alive and kicking? Yep, it's Sally the birthday girl and she's coming for them. But George manages to impale her on a steel pole and it looks like the film is over. Anna feels the baby coming, so they go into the building. And, oh no, it looks like they're in the cinema from the first film. Now they're in trouble. Oh, hang on, it's actually a television studio. Ooh, that was a sneaky trick there, Demons 2. You had me going then. Hannah then shows off great timing by choosing this moment of all to give birth to the couple's child on the floor of the television studio. Well, thank goodness she didn't do that when the demons were kicking about. Speaking of which, oh crap, Demon Sally's back for another round. She's resilient, isn't she? But Sally just sort of falls over and dies and, uh, okay, bit of an anticlimax. But Sally's been broadcast on all the TVs. Oh bloody hell, is she going to come through the TVs as well like the demon at the start of the film? And there's more than one TV this time, and we're going to get multiple Demon Sallies now. But George smashes all the TVs so that that doesn't happen. Phew, thank goodness. Although that doesn't make sense either, because George wasn't around during the start of the film when the demon came through the TV. So how does he know that the demon could come through the TV? And couldn't Demon Sally just show up from another TV somewhere else? Ugh, yeah I know, movie logic. Must stop thinking about the first film. In fact, just like in the first film, there is no explanation as to why this is happening. We don't know where the demons come from, or even what they want. But hey, with a title like Demons 2, were you really expecting anything else? I enjoyed Demons 2 just as much as I enjoyed Demons 1. The special effects are better this time. There's obviously been more um, money spent on, 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 the, on the makeup and what have you. The teeth effects are brilliant. You know, we've got the demon dog now. 
uh, the pacing's quicker, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the film is as well made. I mean, not only have you got that completely out of focus shot, which is inexcusable, let's be honest, but there's also far too many pointless characters, there's a load of pointless scenes, and there's a number of loose ends that are left unresolved before the end of the film. What happened to the little girl? Is that demon dog still knocking about? Are you seriously telling me that George's gas explosion killed off every single demon? Are the demons on the outside, like at the end of Demons 1, or were they all contained inside this time? Was Demons 1 literally just to move it, or was it something that really happened? And with that same thinking, will Demons 2 turn out to be just a movie if I end up watching whichever version of Demons 3 is the real one? What do I mean by that? Well, what with this being an Italian-made horror movie, there's actually a number of films out there that all claim to be Demons 3. And even Cemetery Man, aka Della Morte Della Mar, was re-released as a sequel to Demons in some parts of the world under the title of Demons 95, despite having no resemblance to Demons whatsoever. So in conclusion, if you like your horror movies to be scary, suspenseful and intelligent, this isn't the film to go for on a Friday or Saturday night. However, if you want to see just how much lunacy and violence can be crammed onto the screen in the space of an hour and a half, then Demons 2 delivers a silly, gory, over-the-top collection of demon-munching mayhem that will do the job just nicely. Demons 2 gets a thumbs up.